That's the that's the low tire. That's not a. <laughs> the last I was another light game. Well, there's a fountain light. It's on. And to sit there, think about go. Oil. Oh, washer fluid. Oh, wash. <laughs> Why is it telling me about a fountain? <laughs> so we're currently being recorded. <laughs> oh. We got ready. Yes, we are. All right. Why don't we go ahead and call FNA committee together? Uh, please note attendance of council members, mayor, and staff. And we will proceed on with the agenda. Let me bring that agenda up. Guess I ought to get into. If somebody will advise me if there's any hands up or other items on the Zoom, I'll get there in just a minute. All right. Let's call the meeting to order. Let's move on with agenda approval. Are there any alterations or changes to the agenda as presented? No. Seeing none, we'll move on with the agenda approved as presented. Let's move into public comments. Are there uh, members of the public uh, online or in, pre or in council chambers wishing to make comment before the committee on items not currently on the agenda? We will cover public comment on uh, agenda items as we go down through. Um, let me. Are there any hands up on uh, Zoom? Yeah. Yeah, so I can see that. All right, with that, we'll move on into the agenda. Oh, go away now. All right. First item on the agenda is approval of the minutes dated January 18th, 2023. Are there any committee members uh, with comment or revisions to the minutes as presented? I have none. All right. Seeing uh, no comments on the minutes, unless objected, we'll accept the minutes as presented. They are accepted. Moving on. Approval of warrants and claims. Um, the warrants claims approved and reviewed. I have I have received no comments. I don't know if you've received any comments for the old uh, process. Uh, I reviewed and have no current questions with regards to the warrants. I'm good. You're good. Thank you. All right. No questions. Uh, with that, we uh, let's do a vote on this one just because it's money. Uh, move to approve the warrants as presented. May I have a second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, we're moving on with the warrants as presented. Thank you very much. All right, with that, back to the beginning. All right, let's move to Agenda Bill AB 23017, Classification and Compensation Study. Uh, will we do an introduction to this? All right, uh, good evening, committee members. Um, this agenda bill is the first look at our uh, classification and compensation study of Teamsters and MNP staff. Um, the report is attached as a, an exhibit uh, to this agenda bill, and uh, really it, it should be a, a useful tool for the city in comparing uh, our pay and benefits to that of other similar cities in the region um, and uh, help us attract and attain uh, uh, qualified employees. Um, the report uh, was finalized last month in January, and I believe Jen uh, provided that final document to council in advance of publishing of tonight's agenda, uh, just to allow some more time to review um, and uh, read through that before the meeting. Um, but our plan uh, for tonight is just to give a quick recap um, on the process that we went through to conduct this study and uh, to introduce the final document. So, um, here to help us out tonight with that is our consultant from GovHR. Uh, her name is Joellen Katamartori, and uh, she has a presentation uh, prepared for you tonight. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And I believe she is a, a panelist. So uh, welcome, Joellen. Hello. 
I am not able to start my video though, it says, because the host has stopped it. We'll try and get that figured out for you. But hello everyone, good evening. I do have a presentation. Maybe, maybe I can share my screen and start even though you, um, well, hopefully you can see it. Um, let's see. We see your desktop. There we go. Yep. We okay. See the, we see the All right. Well, you, you can't see me, but you can see my presentation. So um, I'll get started and I'm happy to answer any questions um, at the end. I don't have too many slides and you have the report. Um, so I will go through um, an overview of the study that we completed for the city. Um, so I'll talk about the scope of work, uh, the job evaluation process, the proposed classification plan, the salary and benefits survey that we conducted, the proposed compensation plan at different percentiles that we calculated for you, how you would implement it, and then going forward, you know, the future administration. And what I want to say up front is that everyone has been really terrific in the city, um, that the team that I worked with, the staff has been very helpful. Um, and in order for us to do this work, we really need a partnership and we had that. So I want I want to let you that, know that up front. So uh, you have the report, but generally we were asked to do two things. We did a job analysis and we did a salary and benefit survey. So the job analysis and the development of the classification plan um, started with some meetings with city staff to talk about the project expectations. Uh, we then determined a group of communities to which we should gather information to determine uh, whether or not your salaries were competitive. We had some meetings with the employees to talk about the process, distribute materials, distribute a questionnaire we needed them to fill out and just talk with them in general about what the study was about and the work that we needed them to perform. And again, they were very helpful. All of the consultants with GovHR had meetings with employees during the process, and it was very, very helpful um, to us developing the, the classification and compensation plan for you and developing the report. Um, so after we disseminated the information, we talked with the employees, we went through a job evaluation process and developed a new classification plan, which is essentially the list of the positions in the city um, covered by the study um, in, in a plan in a, uh, with, in assigned to different grades within a classification plan. So that was the first part. And the second part was a survey of the market to determine if your salaries were competitive. So we put together a salary survey and we sent that out. We also did survey some particular benefits. And then at this point, We've made some presentations about the draft report and we have finalized it, which is a, a copy of you have in front of you um, and I'm presenting it in general now, I'll make a couple of more present presentations in February and then hopefully it will be implemented. And I'm sorry if I sound a little stuffy, but I do have a cold. Um, so in the job evaluation process, uh, there were 66 positions that we reviewed as a result of the study. Um, and we looked at different job factors um, in order to develop your classification plan. And the way that we did that was we disseminated a questionnaire to the employees and we asked everyone to fill it out. And we looked at different job factors related to each position in the city. And you can see here, and this questionnaire that we asked the employees to fill out is Appendix A to the report. So the different criteria in that, in that questionnaire related to education needed to perform the work, experience, uh, judgment, all the way down to your work environment and technology needed to perform the work. So that was the first part. We had employees fill out the questionnaire and then we had um, consultants from GovHR interview your employees, at least one person uh, with each job. So the thing that's important about that process, the job evaluation process, is we um, asked employees to fill out the questionnaire, we asked supervisors to comment, 
And then we conducted interviews and we did them virtually with at least one person in each position. And when you look at the different tables in the report and you look at the information we received um, with the, the classification plan and the compensation from the market, you can see that we don't have information for every position. And we did, we were able to make a recommendation on pay ranges because the classification plan establishes what we call internal equity. So when I get to the different tables in the report, uh, especially table two, I can show you what that means when we only have classification and not compensation information. So the first thing that we developed was the classification plan, and that's um, on table one in the report. And table one is on page 24 of a printed report, if you have it, or 27 of the PDF. And so when we talk with the employees, they fill out the questionnaire and we give them a value, we're able to sort it and develop a classification plan. And the positions that score similarly are assigned to the same pay grades. So that's what table one shows you. It shows you all of the positions, the titles and the different grades to which they've been assigned. And that establishes the concept of internal equity, meaning positions that score similarly will be assigned to the same grade. So that's what we do during the job evaluation process. Some of the jobs um, changed as far as their classification is concerned, which is called a reclassification as a result of this process. But the important thing about the job evaluation process is that it's very unique to Snoqualmie. We talk to the people in the city, we learn about the work that's performed, and then we classify the jobs in relation to the work that's performed in your city. So all of the nuances that are related to each position are taken into account during this process. And the reason why I talk about this as much as I do is because it's really what drives your system. So the market compensation, you know, the information we get from the external market is really secondary to the job evaluation process because it is unique to the city. So that was the whole first part of the study. And again, the staff was terrific. Everybody gave us the information we needed. We were able to talk with your employees and develop the classification plan. The next thing we did was we went to the market and we wanted to look at communities to which we could compare. Um, to make sure that we could get information and analyze it uh, based on ability to pay primarily. So you can see here, and this whole analysis is in Appendix B of the report, we went out and we did, we created a, um, a, a comparative community analysis to determine which communities we should ask for information. And so you can see the first and last criteria listed here population and proximity are not financial, but the remainder of them are. So when we want to receive information from the market, we want it based primarily on financial criteria, because if we're making a recommendation to you for pay ranges related to the different positions in the city, it, it really has to be based on ability to pay. So that's what we did in, when we went through this comparable communities analysis. And if you're interested in the detail, it's in the second appendix, appendix B in the report. So as a result of that analysis, we came up with these different communities. And you can see they range from Arlington all the way down to Sumner and Woodenville. There are a few here. Again, I'm sorry, I have cold that have an asterisk, uh, Bellevue and Issaquah and Redmond. Those communities are a little bit different um, from Snoqualmie. They're bigger. Um, they have different resources, different assets. But when we talked with the staff uh, and we thought about employee recruitment and retention, it's important to consider them in this analysis because you lose employees to those communities. So, so they are included in, in the analysis. There is a measure of comparability. They're not as comparable as the other communities listed on this slide, but they are important to be to consider when you're doing this type of analysis. So that was the second part. We, the first part was the job evaluation. The second part was the comparable community analysis. 
One of the things that we want you to know, actually a few things, when you do a salary and benefit survey, um, relate to the fact that not every community uses the same title for each position. So if you went to a different community and were uh, completing the same work, they may use a, a, a different title. So we wanna make sure that we define each position in our salary survey. So we wanna make sure that we're getting the real comparative information. So we do that. We also review the data very thoroughly. And if you look at Appendix C of the report, that's all of the data that we received during the salary survey. And you'll see, I think the IT manager is a good example of a position where in some of the other communities, they had a director position. It wasn't the same position. So when there's some highlighting and then um, on the very next page of the report, it talks, it has the word edited behind the title. If we didn't agree with some of the data we received, we removed it. So we look at it very thoroughly. If we don't think it's relevant, we will remove it, but we show our work. Um, so, so if you look at Appendix C, the detail is there. And, and, if, and if you have any questions about our methodology and how we look at it, you can certainly um, ask us and we're happy to talk about it. The other thing is when we look at looking the market and salary data, we really wanna look at salary ranges as a gauge of the market, as opposed to actual salaries. Um, and the reason for that is sometimes some a community may, may only have an actual salary, but if we only have that, we don't know the market conditions under which that person was hired, nor do we know their tenure. So we prefer to use salary range data. And in your study, we had a lot of information on, on range data. So that was a really good thing in order for us to complete the analysis. And then the last point is that when you do a salary survey at a benefit survey, it really is a snapshot in time. So we did this work last year, you know, we're in the beginning of 2023, but we did it um, in 2022. And all of the information was relevant at that time. There are recommendations in the report as to how to adjust those ranges that we're recommending to keep up with the market. But regardless of what the, the different communities were paying, you know, sometimes they're in FY uh, 23, 22, whatever that, that snapshot in time is, that's your market. So if for some reason a community was behind in adjusting their pay ranges, it's still relevant to the analysis because if there was an employee that was thinking about going to another community, even if that data was lagging, it's still the market. So, it, so it's a snapshot in time. And in the report, there are recommendations on how to adjust the ranges going forward to make sure that you stay competitive with the market. So all of that detail is in Appendix C. The other thing that we looked at were some benefits. And you can see here, here's a list. Um, we looked at insurance, different types of medical insurance, um, disability, some paid time off, retirement benefits. Um, and that really was just something to see if you're on par with the other communities. And in the report, there's a narrative for each one of these benefits that talks about how Snow Palmy compares. And overall, you're you're competitive. You know that you know there's nothing when we look at benefits. It's very surprising if we find out something that is really an outlier. Um, you know there are nuances, there are differences from community to community, but overall you are competitive um, with regard to the benefits that that we looked at that are listed on this slide, and that information as well all of that raw data is Appendix D of the report. So there's four appendices in the report and the last one includes all of the benefits data uh, that we received. And within the body of the report, there is a narrative about you know, how you compare in general to the other communities. But, but I can tell you overall that you are competitive in relations to the benefits. So the proposed compensation plan that we recommended really has um, calculations at three different percentiles. And so after the narrative of the report, there's um, the tables. So I, I referred to the table one, which is the classification plan. Table two, which is on page 26 of the printed version of the report or 29 of the PDA, PDF is the table two, which brings together the classification plan and the compensation plan. And so in talking with city staff, we thought about looking at 
different levels with regard to the pay ranges. So on that table two, we calculated recommended pay ranges at three different percentiles, the 50th, the 60th, and the 75th. And what that means is if you were a payer at the 50th percentile, for example, 50% of the communities pay more for the same position and 50% pay less. At the 60th, 40% pay more, 60% pay less, and at the 75th, 25% pay more and 75% pay less for the same position. So in order to be a more competitive payer, in order to attract and retain employees, the higher the percentile you can be at, the better. So uh, the recommendation is really to be at the 60th, because if you're at the 60th percentile, it, it pretty much in, ensures that you're above average. Because as I mentioned, the 50th percentile is the exact middle, and that can be above or below the average. But the 60th percentile will in, pretty much ensure you're above average as a payer. And based on where you are in Washington, based on what's happening in the market and, and municipal government, if you can start at the 60th and eventually work towards the 75th, that probably would be in your best interest in order, again, to attract and retain employees. So, so all of that data is combined on table two. And if you're just interested in looking at the pay ranges themselves, the very next table, table three, just has the pay ranges for all of the different positions and the different grades. And that's on page um, 28 of the printed version and 31 of the PDF. So there's two couple of things to keep in mind when you look at the compensation plan. Um, we looked at all of those different positions and put them in different grades. Um, and we came up with 14 different grades based on the classification side. And they're separated out into three bands. You have your administrative and technical band, your supervisors and advanced technical band and your directors and senior managers. The reason why we put positions into different pay bands is because two, there's two reasons. One is if I was hired by the city in a position in the administrative and technical band, if I wanted to go to another position in that same band in grades one through five, with some training, I should be able to apply for the position and be successful. But if I wanted to, if I was in a position, say, in grade three, and I wanted to move to a position in the next band, the supervisors and advanced technical in grade seven or eight, it's likely I would not only need some experience, but maybe additional training and education. So the, so the positions are grouped into the bands based on, on the, the similarities they have, the overall complexity of the work. But to move from one band to the next, it does require additional education and training. So that's one reason. The other reason is when we calculate the pay ranges, we look at the data from the market for each band. So when we look at the um, pay for grades one through five, we look at all of that information and calculate pay ranges for that band. Then we move to grades six through 11, which are your supervisors and advanced technical positions, and then 12 to 14 for your the remaining positions. So in order to make those calculations and try and match the market pay or you know what the market is saying you should pay for those positions, we use two different factors. One is called gradation and the other is range spread. So gradation is the difference in starting pay of between one grade to the next. So you can see here on this slide, it says there's a 7.5% gradation between grades 1 through 11 and a 7% for 12 through 14. So all that means is, for example, the starting pay for grade 2 is 7.5% higher than grade 1. Grade 3 is 7.5% higher than grade 2. And then it, it reduces a little bit for grades 12 through 14. But by using that tool, along with the range spread, which is 35% from minimum to maximum, we can really try and look at the market and calculate pay ranges as close to what the market is telling us they should be. And the range spread is just the difference from the minimum pay for each grade to the maximum pay. So, so the maximum pay for each grade is 35% higher than the minimum. 
And then implementing this going forward. Of course, you're going to talk about this further. Um, there's a lot of strategies about this, and this will be coming. Um, but generally, from our perspective, you know, what we talk about is if there's a position or, you know, an employee's current pay that is lower than uh, what we're recommending for the minimum of a range, that that pay really should be brought up to the minimum. And for an employee whose current pay is within the range, it should go in at the current pay um, with, without losing any money. So if you, you're going to use a defined increment plan, which is a step plan, so you would look at the current pay, put it in the new range at the closest step without losing pay. You know, you want to make sure that the person is always made whole or a little bit better than that. And for anyone whose pay is above the maximum, they just stay where they are, you know, because eventually the range will catch up as you're maintaining it over time. So sometimes jobs are reclassified. Sometimes the market value of a position changes. So that doesn't have anything to do with the incumbent employee. So it, we always say, just keep them where they are and eventually the range will catch up. And then the last point is really just going forward. You know, again, your staff has been really terrific during this whole study. Not only their team that, I, that we were able to work with, you know, with the people at GovHR, but your employees. You know, in order for us to do a study like this, people have to be forthcoming with information. And they were, you know, they really, really were. So, so you have the tools now to maintain this system. You've, um, and if you implement it, it will last you for a long time. As long as you're maintaining your classification plan, meaning, you know, looking at it every year, seeing if anything's changing, using the questionnaire um, and the job analysis tool to classify jobs, that will last you for a long time. You know, unless Snoqualmie um, experiences significant growth and you're adding many, many positions, it should last you at least 10 years. And then on the, on the compensation side, you know, you have those comparable communities. You know, we looked at different communities. And if you're sending an email, you know, if, if finance sends an email every year and says, you know, are you adjusting your ranges? If so, by how much? You take an average of that and you adjust your ranges by a similar amount, then, then your pay will be um, competitive with the market for some time to come as well. So, so it's pretty straightforward to manage the system going forward both on the classification and compensation side. And, you know, in speaking with the staff, you know, we're available for a year or so going forward. We're at the final report stage. We'll have a couple of more presentations um, this month. And then, um, you know, September rolls around and there's a question, ask the question and we'll answer it. You know, we, we want to make sure that you can use the system. It's important to us um, that you can use it going forward. And it, it really, it's not that difficult to maintain and it will last you for a long time. So with that, um, that's my general overview of the study. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Why don't we uh, hold a little bit on uh, discussion at the moment. Please stay on the line, but we'll hold for a second here. If that's okay, I think uh, this might be the opportunity uh, before we, the committee, get into discussion. Uh, I'd like to give the opportunity for uh, any public comment. So again, are there uh, members of the community here present or online wishing to make a uh, comment in regards to this material? I don't see any hands here and I don't see any hands online, okay? Let's dive into it. Uh, can we go back to that slide where you're talking the percentages between uh, between grades and then the percentage between max men at the different uh, banding you've got? Mm hmm. Whoops. Sharing my screen, but I don't see anything. Mm. There it is. There it is. Hold on a second. I think maybe I tried to advance too quickly. Nope. Well, so let me ask my question though. Um, 
you basically state that you're uh, within the bands you're expecting a 35 percent difference between the minimum and maximum salary uh in all three of the different uh classification groupings uh how was that determined so that's the range spread. So there's the two things. The gradation is the difference in the starting pay. The range spread is um, the difference from minimum to maximum. And it really depends on what the market is telling us, you know, as far as what it should be, you know, so so sometimes the range spread is 30 percent. Sometimes it goes up to 40 percent. Usually I calculate within that range. So um, when I look at comparable communities, that's normally what they do, you know? So I'm looking at all of the data and then I'm trying to make a recommendation that closely reflects the market. And for you, it was 35%. That that seemed to make sense. But but normally, you know, it, it could be as low as 30 and, a, you know, as high as 40. I usually don't calculate um, lower than 30 or over 40. So you're about right in the middle for what I would recommend for a range. Okay. Councilor Watt, do you have any questions? Yeah, I do. So, in, in I, I guess, twofold. One is where are we at, if we look at the 60%, where are we at as far as being on par? Are we in the ballpark now, or is it going to impact our budget going forward? Um, whether it's this biennium or the next one, if we were to put this in place. And, and that may be a Ms. Ferguson question. <laughs> um, whether or not, um, Joellen, if you have a comment on that, um, that is what we are working on analysis on uh, um, Joellen has provided those those three percentiles, and so um, we have to determine you know where how close we are. And how it maps answer that over. question. A absolutely. So that that would be part of uh, any continued discussions coming forward when we bring forward implementation planning. All right. My my second question to that: If the range is thirty five percent, I would assume that. The midpoint is 17 and a half percent and or am I misreading the interpretation because I've 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 seen it in practice where you have this target that's right smack in the middle that's a hundred percent or 1.00 and you tend to have a philosophy of hiring in at 0.95 or 0.98 or or exactly the target so um, is that part of the consideration as far, and I don't want to get too deep in the, the, the weeds, but I do think that there's um, a need for the council to know how close are we to that target so that we can ensure that we have equity across all classifications in, in reaching that. And, and once we achieve it, and then we set our sight on 70%, for instance. That again is something that we would be bringing forward so that you would you would see that um, that map out of um, where where we would land um, if the Council chose to um, go one one direction or another. Um, so we're working on scenarios and that's where uh, we'll be bringing a lot of information to you uh, to help answer those questions. Okay, thank you. Just to be clear, uh, there are two different groups that this study covers. The management and professionals groups and also uh, the Teamsters bargaining unit. What Jen is referring to is scenarios for implementation for management and professionals. The Teamsters bargaining unit is obviously a negotiated contract. Thank you. Comes from right here. So, um, I'm curious about um, just following on on the point that city administrator just made. So, um, 
I know that uh, one of the reasons we were doing this study is some concerns that the Teamsters Union had expressed regarding the topic of the study. Um, and I'm just curious, uh, I'm, without telling me any particular comments they may have made, I'm not asking that. I'm just curious, what has been the interaction with the union? Um, are they uh, aware of the results? Have they had a chance to give input to it? Kind of what was their involvement and kind of what's the status of their knowledge of this study at this point? Um, I can I can answer that question. So the the re, the final report, once it was done, then was provided to um, our Teamsters group, so that they have had the report. Um, so from a, as as a city administrator Sarawain has said, is that this is the beginning stages of bargaining with with that group, and so uh, I believe they all have. Uh, the final report, and that is where folks are now studying the report because it is, as you know, uh, rather lengthy and has a lot of information. So that's that's essentially where we're at. Um, we uh, we will begin those conversations. Um, our legal counsel, Sophia Maybe, with Summit Law, is leading uh, our negotiations for the city uh, with the Teamsters, and so that is, um, you know, the uh, the. Uh, topic that that we'll be discussing is the report, uh, answer questions, and, and then of course the negotiations uh, would would certainly uh, begin. Right. So, by the way, my printer at home thanks you for the size of the report. It enjoyed printing all that. <laughs> at least it seemed to. It went on and on for quite a while. So. Um, but no, uh, in seriousness, so not asking anything about negotiations just trying to understand the report itself. So a question that's kicking around in my mind, and, and again, I'm not, please don't, I'm not asking about any specific comments that may have been made. I'm trying to understand the general way in which the union interacted with the preparation of the report. So I'm just curious, say for example, if uh, the union had had some concern that some area of the report had been put together in a way they thought missed the mark. Have they had the opportunity to communicate that? Is that something that um, sort of got fed back or factored into the preparation? Or um, is that really not the process by which the report gets pulled together? I'm just trying to understand how that interaction would have worked. Well, you want to answer that? I guess an easy answer to the question is yes. Uh, you know, as, as JoLynn pointed out, uh, all employees had the opportunity to fill out a survey and tell us, you know, what their job was. Also, as Joanne pointed out, different cities are going to title jobs differently. Yeah. You know, in one city, you'll have an engineer one, two, and three, with three being the highest. In the next organization, you'll have an engineer one, two, and three, with one being the highest. And, you know, part of her task was to be able to ferret out that information and try to compare apples to apples as much as possible. One of the realities is that Snoqualmie is a bit of is a bit of a unicorn. Mm. There aren't a lot of cities of fifteen thousand people that have a water, sewer, storm utilities, full police, full fire. Most of other cities out there, you know, uh, they contract for police all of North Bend. Uh, or they have a water and sewer district that provides their water and sewer services. They may receive their fire services uh, through a fire through, through a fire district. So you know a lot of those things get worked into the study. And so there definitely was you know a back and forth conversation with the union about that. And again, as as Joanne pointed out, there are some positions where we didn't have a lot of comparables and we didn't have a lot of data points. Because again, there aren't a lot of cities out there that are full service cities that have our population. Right, so let me try now. I didn't get the answer to the question I'm trying to drive at. So um, try one more time though, uh, which is, so when you go in, when we go into negotiations with the union, there's lots of things that get discussed. They might bring up hey, you know, we see this position or this set of positions, you know, a little differently, fine, that's all 
things that happen in negotiations. What I'm really trying to drive at is, um, w w is it, I I'm trying to s sort of get at the idea of, could it be that the union says, hey, I reject that whole study. It's just too far off. Or was there enough interaction to where they've had input on the study, that would be an unlikely result. Rather, sure, in negotiations, there might be all sorts of aspects of what's in the study that get discussed, but they wouldn't be, they would have felt like they, not the employees themselves, but the union had enough interactions such that they would accept it as a, a starting place. That's what I'm trying to get at. Well, we are in an open meeting, and so I'm going to couch my answer rather carefully. If the union were to say, and I'll talk specifically about water and sewer positions, that because you compared yourself to a number of cities that don't have their own water and sewer utility, would you be willing to take a look at comparable salaries for say, Sammamish Plateau water and sewer or Rose Lodge water and sewer, you know, that provide services uh, to rural areas and also do also incorporated cities. And my answer to that would be, of course. You know, our mantra from the beginning has been that we don't cherry pick the data, we don't cook the numbers, we want to be as intellectually honest as we can, the numbers are what they are. Uh, and, you know, if there is other data that the union would want us to look at in a negotiation session, of course we'd be open to looking at that. Got it. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I got one other itch. Um, again, it's based on the salary ranges because I get a, a min max for a salary range. I'm not told what the median is, so I don't know what if that is a skewed curve, up, low, down. Um, I worry that, you know, if if some of our comparable cities either paid low or paid high, it may skew that data. Uh, and I'm further concerned with the, you know, seven or seven and a half percent between grade and then uh, a blanket statement of, was it 35, 30%, 35% between high and median. Um, I guess I'm used to more seeing uh, a statement of, Here's 10% uh, of the salary range, 90% of the salary range, meeting the salary range with a confidence level of 90%. Okay, so I'm, I, I'm used to a little more statistical analysis than what I'm getting out of this report. Am I unrealistic? Well, I mean, there's a lot of data in the report. And if you look on the data sheets in Appendix C, you can see there's a lot of calculations at the bottom based on the data we received from the market. So with regard to skewing, I think, which was your first point, um, there were some, there's a lot of information for a lot of the positions. So if you took out a few of the data points, it probably doesn't make a big difference because we had plenty of data. Um, so, so that's a good thing from a statistical standpoint. The gradation, is just the difference in starting pay. It just turns out that it was around seven, it was seven and a half or seven percent for you. And that just matches the market. You know, what if in other studies, depending on how many grades there are, they could be as low as five percent, they could be as high as 20%. Um, and that, and by by putting positions in pay bands, we actually can really isolate the data for the market a lot better than if I was trying to calculate a gradation for 14 grades and tying them all together. That, that would really not match the market as well as it does now. So, so there's that. And then the range spread is really just the, the difference from minimum to maximum. So the point that you're raising with regard to like a midpoint or where you are within the range, or if you want to benchmark to that uh, with regard to people and where they are in their tenure, you could still create all of that. You know, all we're doing is is giving you a format for um, what what is a reasonable pay range for a position based on what we see in the market. So how how you implement that and manage it going forward is is really a, a little bit of a local option, um, but we can certainly help you. 
you know, determine what, what you might want to do if you want to update any, any practices or procedures, you know, based on what we've seen elsewhere. So, so right now, um, the desire of the city is to go with a defined increment plan, um, which is a step plan, um, and, and how people are moved into that or where they should be at a different point in their career, um, you know, we can certainly help you. So, so there is a lot of information there. Um, you know, it, it's not, it's not at a high, super high statistical level, but it is a methodology that we use around the country um, that, that is appropriate for this type of analysis. Just one. Just another follow-up question, and that's, I, I do like the gradation. I like the banding. I think it's it's a great approach to this. Um, the one thing that I'm, it just kind of in the back of my mind, <clears throat> is that we're near some very big influencers that are included in this survey, which is great. But I'd, I'd be a little bit curious. I think that the the factor is like 5% rather than 50%. But how much would that change some of the outcome if like Bellevue and Redmond and Issaquah, which are direct competitors, if that was just tweaked a little bit from like 5% to 10% or 15%, just to see if maybe some of those outliers do not become outliers. Was, has that been tested at all or, or is that practical to do? I mean, you know, we, we looked at the data based on what they're paying for the positions. And in those communities, because they are so much larger than you, they have a different ability to pay. There's no question about that, you know? And if you look at the comparable community analysis, you can see they're not as comparable based on those different factors that we use in that methodology. So if you took them out, would it have an impact? Probably not overly significant, no, um, but but maybe a little bit. Um, so the bigger the bigger question is because of the market that we're in right now, because of the ability to attract and retain employees, it makes sense to include them um, in this analysis. But uh, we didn't we didn't slice it and dice it to the level that you're suggesting um, because they're you know bigger fish in the pond as far as the size and the ability to pay and the number of employees that they have. We didn't do that. We included them because they're your direct competitors, and, but we qualified it by showing how comparable they are to you. you know, So we definitely ran them through the analysis so you could see they are different, but in, in talking with the city staff, um, we, we thought it was important to get that information from them. And again, you know, I go back to, to what I said before, is for a lot of the positions in the study, we had a lot of data. You know, we, which is a really good thing. You know, it would be one thing if we had those three communities and three other communities or two other communities, and those were only, you know, data points. That is, that would have a different um, impact on the analysis than when we have 15 data points, and maybe we had two or three of those from those other three communities. So, so we did look at that, um, and. You know, it's just in light of the circumstance of where you are located geographically and who your competition is that we included them. But but to your point, we didn't we didn't go with, we didn't do that deep of a dive to to um, maybe look at the numbers in in more depth as you're suggesting. We really took them on face value. But can I ask a follow-on question? Uh, for those uh, job descriptions in which you marked them as edited and took them out, so you consider them as outliers for one reason or another, what can you give us examples of the reasons you would determine them as outliers and mark them as edited and take them out? So the best example, I think, was that IT position that I mentioned. I, I don't, I'd have to pull up the report to see exactly what page it's on. The position that you have is a manager level 
And in those other communities, it was a director level. So when we edited out any data, which is highlighted for you to look at, you know, so it, so if you see, I think it's some blue highlighting for um, a, a community, we highlighted the, the data we're questioning. And then on the next page, it says edited behind the title and those data points are removed for that particular community. It's because we know it's not the same job. So when you have a manager level job being compared to a director level job, it's not the same job. So it's really based on that. It's based on the overall duties of the position as opposed to if it's just an outlier. And we really try to rely on the information we get from the comparable communities because we do take the time in the surveys that we put together to define your positions. You know, we want to make sure we are getting the best comparative data and we try to look at it and say, yes, this is, if they're telling us this is the comparable position, we're going to use it unless we really know it's not the same. So, so if you look through that appendix, appendix C, there's not, you'll see there's a lot of different titles in there and they are the same jobs. They're just using, choosing to call them different different titles because they're relying on the description that we provided in the salary survey. But you, you didn't eliminate any because of uh, outliers term of salary. No, mm -mm. no, we only, we only eliminate it if we know it's not the same job because, yeah. because, and think about it this way. And this is what gets back to the job evaluation process. You know, in Snoqualmie, you may choose to pay a position higher because you value it differently than maybe a Redmond. You know, you may choose to pay it less because you value it differently. That's why we spend so much time on the job evaluation piece on your internal equity because it's created for your city. And then we apply the market data secondarily to that. You know, you, you brought up the point about the union before, you know, we knew that there were going to be positions that we were not going to get a lot of data for. We knew that because of things that were already highlighted, but by establishing internal equity, by saying those particular positions are valued at this level in Snoqualmie, that pay range that we're recommending has to apply to those positions because overall, the knowledge, skills, and ability need to, needed to perform the work is similar enough, and therefore they should have the same pay range. So, so absent being able to get good data from the market, we're still able to make a recommendation on the pay range. Now, there's further discussion on how you're going to deal with that going down the road, because if they can get more data and you can consider it, that's fine. But with the parameters with, within which we were working, that's how we would normally approach it. Councilor Ron? I have another question now that I'm thinking about this more. So our city is unique in the fact that we have fire, we have police, we have um, our own water and sewer, and, and the people that support it, the IT, the city administrator, the city finance department, where are, are we ensuring that we're comparing those positions with equal weight to similar cities with that complexity? Um, and, and if we have, that's great, but it just gives me a little bit peace of mind in knowing because those roles, those support roles are more complex because of the diversity of services that the city provides. Right. Right, exactly. Exact. That's that's exactly what I'm speaking to. And I, I was just talking to another client on the East Coast earlier about the exact same issue today. So, so every community is unique and every service delivery model is unique, right? So you may have similar services, but even within the similar services, there always are nuances. So if your scope of delivery service delivery is broader, say, for example, than to one of the comparable communities, and your city manager is managing your community, and he decides, I want to go be a, community, a city manager someplace else, it's still a city manager position. It's a public works director position. It's a police chief position. The position is the same. 
what varies from community to community is the scope of responsibility or the changes in the essential functions or the volume of work, which is a staffing issue, not a classification issue. So that might make your incumbent employee more competitive to compete for a job elsewhere if their experience is broader. But you could bring somebody in to, to fill one of those positions from another community, even if they're lacking, you know, maybe one component of it, because eventually they can be brought up to speed. So, so similar communities have similar service delivery, but it's not going to be exactly the same. It, it, it just isn't. So that's why on the job evaluation side, that's why we have people fill out the questionnaire. That's why we have supervisors comment. That's why we, we have the employee interviews. So we can grade the positions to the most complex work that is being conducted in your community, which takes into that, that it takes into account that scope of responsibility and it makes it unique to your city. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me ask a question because I I want to get into a discussion. I do not want to get into a discussion here on um, compensation plan options. Okay, um, would it be appropriate for us to recommend maybe an executive session at council? to get the council involved in a, a discussion of these options and understanding what they are. But again, I view that as getting, I don't want to, I, that's compensation stuff, contract stuff, and I mm -hmm. do not want to do that in a public forum. Um, I, I can uh, answer that. So what uh, we've talked about in, in our kind of, what's the next steps, where's the discussion? So the next steps was for the full council to receive the this report. Uh, and then allow for time, like I'd indicated, we are working on creating uh, an implementation plan and scenarios for the council then to start having the discussion about financial impact, uh, about compensation philosophy, excuse me, philosophy, it's been a long day, uh, <laughs> philosophy, um, the, the plan that, that you're interested in, in pursuing, giving staff direction on uh, you know what information you want to see bringing some of these details back these questions that you've asked uh, so our goal uh, with that had been the last meeting in February and that's where we had identified a possible uh, uh, executive closed session with the council to start having uh, those discussions so I asked a question tonight three times couldn't get an answer and the reason is the answer kept drifting into nego union negotiation topic and so of course for all the right reasons that is not where that discussion should go in open session so that's that's right so uh but i never got the answer to my question so that's fine but what i i think you're trying to do right now is say look we've got this study that's completed or near completion. That's a different topic than what then happens next in terms of what happens with compensation, whether that's M&P, whether that's negotiations with the union, all those things are next. They're not part of just this report being done. So if that's what you're trying to accomplish, what I think is fantastic. I'd still say let's have a, an executive session because I would hate to not accomplish that objective, which is have everyone sort of, let me say it differently, have the council members satisfied that they understand the study, anything they had curiosity about that that was answered, and so that that is now, the study itself is behind us, now what we have left to do is deal with it. So, so my thought is have an executive session just so we get to that outcome. I just as a practical matter, uh, there are four council members who did not, well, they can listen to the tape, um, but did not get the benefit of the presentation this evening. Would it make sense for us then at the next council meeting to have a round table at six o'clock uh, and have the same presentation given again, um, give the other four council members an opportunity uh, to ask questions or get clarified information 
and then we can schedule an executive session uh, at the next council meeting or get a bunch of stuff on the agenda for that meeting too as a practical matter. Uh, do you want then to try to schedule an executive session at our next council meeting or do you want to wait till the second council meeting in February to have an executive session? Second meeting. Uh, okay. Second meeting. My vote would be first meeting because I think s some of that discussion gives you guidance in the work you're proposing to do for that second meeting. Go ahead. And there's there's no minimum. I mean, we can have an executive session at the first council meeting and the second council meeting. We could put an executive session on there come exactly. 10 o'clock Monday night, decide not to have it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm looking over at the city clerk right now. So would it make sense then to do a round table from six yeah. to seven um, and have a similar prison, have, have a, uh, have Joel and give a, give a similar presentation and then schedule an executive session for the end of the meeting. And okay. I can't call on you. Councilman Mayhew. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I, I would just say um, I, I agree with that point. Th this presentation would be fantastic. I, I think the full council needs to get the benefit of this. Um, it's not the correct words. I think the full council would benefit and would appreciate this hearing this presentation. Second thing I'd say is, I think have the presentation and the executive session at the same meeting so that we don't sort of forget and then recover a bunch of ground. Um, as far as which meeting it is, I would just say whatever the agenda allows. My favorite thing is starting early, so I have an extra hour of council meeting, but if that's what we got to do, that's what we got to do. Um, but I would just say, put them together at the same meeting. Uh, I I don't, you know, which one is fine, although I, I will say to the extent that council gives some input, I would say the earlier the better, because I hate to see you do work and then have us zigzag you, right? That like just is a waste of your time. So, but then beyond that, just whatever the, well, the, the uh, agenda can tolerate, right? But as suggested, let's do a six o'clock uh, round table to go through this presentation. Let's at least put a place marker for an executive session at the end of council. Mm -hmm. And if we're running late, skip it. I'm not going to be here till midnight. Um, we can have this conversation another time. But if there's time, I, again, I do think uh, at least some of the conversation I have may be foundational for some of the analysis you're doing. So I'd like to give you that feedback up front. Sure. And we appreciate that. You know, there's there's nothing worse than running down the road, you know, getting a bunch of work done and then being told, oh, wait a minute, yeah, you need not to that go rock. in this other direction I've, instead. So. Yeah, I've been there many a time. <laughs> go get me a rock, not that rock. <laughs> <laughs> you know uh, <laughs> I don't want to put you in that position. Okay, thank you for your, your information. We'll probably see you in a week. Um, all right. With that, uh, we'll close out on the agenda, move on with the rest of the count agenda. All right. Good night. Good night. Thank, Thank you, you again. Thank you. Welcome. To the beginning. Get my eyeballs in. All right. Let's move on to, don't bother me right now, agenda bill 230022, Murder and Understanding, SPD, and IAFF. Who will cue this one up? Uh, I'm going to do that for you, Chair. Uh, the purpose of this agenda bill is for the Council's consideration and approval of an incentive retention pay program for eligible employees. Uh, if you recall, the Council approved uh, an incentive retention pay program for management and professionals employees uh, back in November uh, and set criteria uh, for the administration to um, to utilize and, and move forward uh, with potential for uh, working with our collective bargaining groups. Uh, tonight uh, for you, the exhibits, the, the two bargaining groups that have provided uh, what we'll call tentative agreements uh, are the uh, M or MOUs from the Snoqualmie Police Association 
and MOU from the International Association of Firefighter Local 2878. We have provided um, those MOUs um, that we have um, uh, worked with uh, with those two uh, represented groups. Um, we've provided the budget impacts um, of uh, implementing uh, this particular pay program. If you recall, it was uh, based on some installments, um, based on the employees time uh, uh, with the with the city and then of course it is extended out so that um, ensures that some folks uh, want to stay with us um, the impacts to this if you remember during the biennial budget discussion and adoption um, these are um, dollars that were were not necessarily known um, at the time and so the estimated cost of, of these programs um, total about 280,000. Um, the biennial budget did not include um, this appropriation um, in those functional classifications, so uh, hence an amendment would have to be made. Um, and that was that one time um, expenditures uh, and fund balance that was forecasted. And so, nonetheless, this is uh, in the budget impact statement. Um, we've identified and what those those dollar amounts would be uh, in the in the uh, two periods of the biennial budget for that that total of 280,000. Um, so uh, that is essentially what we are bringing forward uh, for you. Um, these are um, uh, bonuses for a total of ten thousand dollars. This was at the police and fire. Uh, level of a bonus that the the council provided us uh, with um, through that first process, and so I'm happy to answer any questions about this uh, particular uh, this proposed action uh, before you. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first is, uh, can we have a uh, an appropriation amendment? brought forward at the same time so that we could appropriately and I understand that takes two readings so but but could we at least get that brought forward at the same time on the first read we'd find out if there was any concern with that uh, and if I th so, so we just get our our housekeeping done at the same time that would be my first question if we could do that and then the second um, is so I understand the question may not be appropriate for open session, but my question is, have we had discussions with the city of North Bend about their willingness to fund their portion? And if that is something that should be handled, that question should be handled separately, then that's fine with me. We can handle it separately. If we could handle that separately, that would be appreciated. So perhaps what we could do then is, um, I, I don't, I don't want to hold this why don't up. We put that in the, that executive session we talked That's about. That's what I was going to suggest. I don't want to hold this up going to. Subjects in that executive session. Yeah, I don't want to hold it up going to the council, but perhaps we could include that in the in the. Uh, exe, uh, exe, am I using the right term, city attorney? Executive session. Well, for I, don't know if I need this. Um, for matters related to collective bargaining, it would be a closed session. Closed um, session, yes. Okay. For matters related to legal potential legal ramifications related to the uh, the ILA with North Bend, that would be an executive session. So, okay. So whichever's appropriate if for those two topics. And if notice we could... both, and, and council could do one after the other. Okay. Closed thanks. executive session. <laughs> <laughs> Which meets neither requirement. No, no. <laughs> I'm good. Uh, I'm good also, so let's move this forward on to council for their consideration. All right. And, but, but but to be clear, with a um, a uh, an appropriation amendment as well, we'd like an appropriation. We don't yeah. need to see first. Just go ahead and bring that to the council, right? Uh, yes, that's that that's okay, what uh, Drew and I were just talking about. That that we will bring that forward. Thank you. All right, let's move on to Agenda Bill 23024, City Council Appointment and Timeline. So 
Mission thing A or B? B. Well, I, I uh, before we get into A or B, I do have a question though. Um, and it was a question that was asked of me right now. Um, that last paragraph. Go down. So, I can. What would it take so that whoever we get as an appointee here? Has to will now have to run for office in November. What would it take to make that November run a four year? He's shaking can't, his head like, "What right. are you doing, it's, you crazy person?" Can't, no, <laughs> the, the statute provides for because of the length of the term specifies how long the person would then serve being elected. Then they would have to stand for election at the at the expiration oh. of the term. So you. Short answer is the council doesn't have the power to make this upcoming election now be for a four year term right. because it, it only goes through 2025. So we have to appoint, you have to take the appointee for the remainder of the term. Correct. Can't just say till November and then do a new election for a four year period. Mm -hmm. Correct. No. It's, for, Correct. The, it's All right. for the remainder of the term. Understand that. Just follow up question. Just curious, um, because many have noted that we have this sort of imbalance in when the election, you know, when the city's elections happen. If at some point the city wanted to change the timing, you know, the, the timing of when one of those positions was elected, whether it's one of the council members or the mayor, what what's the is there, I assume there's some process by which that can happen. Do you know what that is? The statute prescribes when the local elections are, and I believe there there was discussion of a bill to um, make those fall in the even numbered years when there's higher turnout, at least for some cities. I don't, I've not followed that issue, and the mayor may right, have I think heard more through about that. King them. County Council. That isn't what I was asking. We, we don't have the power to do that. No, no, no. That's no not sorry, sorry, that's not what I asked. Oh, okay. I misunderstood them. No problem. Uh, I asked it poorly. It's not your mistake. What I'm trying to ask is we have uh, seven council positions and one mayor position, so a total of eight positions. Um, what one might think is four of those positions would be up every two years. But that's not the case. Correct. So, therefore, there, the seven, it's an odd number, uh, you, you know, sort of at whatever time in history when those seven were established, were established with certain starting dates and then they just go four years. That's just how that works. What I'm asking is if we wanted to take one of the council positions and say, instead of being, um, you know, this four year cycle, we're going to move it to a different four-year cycle, so that you had a different lineup, right? How, what would be the process by which that happened? Have I asked it better yet, or is it still no, confusing? I understand the question. <laughs> uh, I would need to mull that over, and I'm not sure that it can be done, um, but uh, it, I would want to give that some thought. All right. I, I think there's some interest. So actually, I, I, if I understand the question, changing for example, position, instead of positions one, three, and five, it's two, four, and six on this cycle. Something like that, yeah. Asking about, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think there's a lot of curiosity just about, so, so you clearly answered the question that was given about this particular opening. Great, that's useful. But I think there's still like just curiosity, like how, like how would that ever happen if we wanted to, we as a city, wanted to have that changed is there like how would that work okay so maybe you could let us know some future time okay all right but not you have a question yes oh, sorry, as that. an option could we dissolve the city charter and then start again next question oh, <laughs> oh, oh, quick answer snoqualmie is a non-charter code city and so there's no charter to design okay thank you 
I assumed it was rhetorical. <laughs> uh, all right. So then the so that's out of the way. Question is propose is propose option A or option B as far as timeline to uh, appoint a new council member. What are the considerations one versus the other besides time? Well, I think the uh, the biggest consideration is with option B, you would be able to have the person participate in the uh, city council mm -hmm. retreat. That they would be, I mean, yeah, a member of the public that's an open meeting, anybody can participate. Um, but, you know, what it would do is it, the appointment would be completed before the scheduled city council retreat. Okay. Might, might be a... a a uh, good hurdle that if you if you put your your resume in to apply you have to come to the retreat <laughs> but anywho all right rhetorical again i'm sorry any opinions i am in favor of proposal a and we will have six council members that are seasoned there participating, setting the tone. That seventh council member can attend. They haven't been selected yet. My my preference would be proposal A. Well well, in A, any and any or all of the candidates may attend as public. Yes. That, uh, that is the extent of their their, their allowed participation. Councilman, yes, yeah, so I. My initial reaction is the same as Councilman Watton, but I just want to ask the question because there's some reason why there's two options. Something, some there's some reason why one would be better. That something would be accomplished by doing one versus the other. And I feel like I'm missing what that is. Like so, there's a longer one. Or a shorter one. What? You're you're giving people either two weeks or one month to decide if they want to throw their hat in the ring. Oh, I see. So it's just a question of do you really want to squeeze this down and go quickly, or do you want to have a little more time? Okay. In that case, I completely agree with Councilmember Watton. As usual. <laughs> Which is the longer time frame, right? Yeah. Okay. But and so, but let's do this as let's move the agenda bill to council with a committee recommendation of proposal B. You weren't looking for us to make to make the call tonight. No. no. Okay. Uh, committee recommendation of proposal A. Please. A. I'm sorry. It's <laughs> <laughs> a little sleight of hand. <laughs> Freudian slip. My fault. <laughs> Oh, nice little shrimp there. Yeah, nice cat. You caught me. <laughs> you would have caught me at council <laughs> if I remembered to do it. All right. Thank you. All right. I think that's. Other than that, talk to your friends, neighbors, enemies, whoever. <laughs> uh, with that, let's. Uh, let me get back to the beginning of the agenda. I believe that in concludes. Oh, we have. Uh, all right, let's go to agenda bill 2325, council retreat agenda, proposed action review and discuss. And you'll see the, the write up from consultant of uh, proposed timeline dates. Questions, comments, or good for discussion at council? You and I are probably, yeah, yeah we're, we're fine. <laughs> what do you think, Jim? Uh, what's the question? <laughs> Send it to council or Send don't? It. Send it to council. Send it to council for discussion, or, yeah, unless we want to have, you want to have some discussion here on it. You know, it, has Mayor Pro Tem been involved in yes. this? Fine, send it to council. All right, let's go to council with that. All right, let's go back up.
And do we have this? Is there a discussion on upcoming agenda items, or are we just going to go to council agenda? There's really nothing upcoming. Yeah, I didn't. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and review draft uh, council agenda. Uh, uh, do we want to put a round table in at six o'clock uh, for the uh, compensation survey? This doesn't look like that heavy an agenda. Why do we think there isn't room on the regular agenda? Because I've walked many meetings thinking this is going to be a short and sweet night. We've been there till 10 o'clock, but other than that. <laughs> Do we do we think we can do it with roundtable starting at seven? What? No, no. The, you can't start the roundtable at seven by the count the rules of procedure. You can only start it at six. Right. The those meeting time is seven o'clock. That's in. That's in the. So are you? You need to rephrase your question to me then. Are you suggesting that the presentation be done as part of council? That's what I was trying to say. Yes. Thank Sorry you. about that. Because it, it seems like there's enough, like that, that doesn't seem like that's a really long meeting. I know famous last words, don't say it out loud, you jinx it, but it doesn't seem like that long a meeting to me to just start at seven and just have that, you know, be part of the regular meeting. Staff, any have any objection? Would you like to, I'm just trying to figure out the scheduling for the, uh, closed meeting uh, or executive session. Would you want to have that at the end of the meeting then? The end of the meeting. Okay. If we so run we, out of time, we run out of time. So the presentation you received this evening would be a presentation under presentations, and then there would be the executive session and the closed meeting at the end of the agenda. Okay. And, and I think, and I can't keep it straight. One of the closed executive session items could be sacrificed for time. I think one week I have to have, we should have that discussion. So let's keep that in mind going forward. Uh, so if there are no objections, we'll move into the presentations portion. Um, the uh, salary review. Okay. And then we got a proclamation 2302, Twin Peaks Day. All right. Uh, we'll move into council minutes, approve the claims report, or actually consent agenda, task order 50, stormwater management action plan, um, and community development multifamily tax exemption schedule. So, so there'll be an ordinance for the budget amendment. First read. Uh, yeah, that'll be down in F and A. We'll have to. No, no, add. under ordinances. Oh, that's right. It's got to be under ordinances. All right. Will you guys take note with it? We'll have an ordinance first reading, uh, budget amendment to support. Um, where did that go? To support the compensation for uh, police and fire. Oh, it's O two two, right? Yeah, where is it? Yeah, it's number seven, you. item seven. Number seven, okay, support item seven, there it is. So, so which means probably it's a practical matter. Oh no, we've already had the presentation, never mind. Yep. Yeah, we already had the presentation. Now that I've had trouble finding it, I've, I've just never mind. The title could say something about what it is, other than, but whatever. Never mind. All right. Except it's SPA, not SPD, unless we move to Seattle. <laughs> Make that that uh, we'll correct that error. <laughs> Point of order. Yeah. Um, do you have appointments? In lieu of our missing council member 
at least temporarily. Or do, did I miss that? Was that in the last meeting? Do you have any, any? No, no other change. There's minor changes in point, but mostly it's, I'm the victim. Um, <laughs> Excellent. But let's put at least a comment in there about uh, appointments and committee assignments. Uh, for the time being, I'll pick up Parks and Public Works. Um, well, and I'll just tell you right now, my intention is out of next council to appoint Councilor Benson as chair. Okay, excellent. Um, I'll remain on on as a member until we get a new. Well, once we get a new one, new council appoint a new council member. Let's figure out how that all fits. Right. Uh, so just for some continuity, I'll probably stay on Parks and Public Works. We'll have to figure out how that new. Uh, New council member fits in with the overall picture. Yeah. Good. Uh, yeah. So for right now, the change will be I'll go on Parks and Public Works. We just did have a conversation on LTAC. I'll okay. participate in LTAC in lieu of uh, Mr. Lisay, and based on their availability and my availability, we'll schedule something to get something going. Great. Okay. And other than that, I'm leaving. Liaisons and that stuff alone until we get Makes say Junior in place and we can settle it all down. <laughs> Famous last words. Uh, okay. All right. Presentation proclamations. We'll approve the minutes. We'll approve the claims. We'll do the task order. We will have an ordinance in regards to the budget amendment. Public safety committee at this stage has no agenda bills moving forward. Uh, no, outside of consent. Uh, community development has a multifamily tax exemption schedule. I assume uh, Joe will talk about that and bring us up to speed. And we will have the finance compensation study. That's no longer, that's part of presentation at this stage. It's not a separate agenda bill. Correct? I'm sorry, can you? Yeah. Classification compensation stu study, it's a number six. Number six, is that now a presentation? Or are you expecting further discussion? We're, we're expecting that to be a presentation, so we would, we would move that up um, under presentations. And then um, the intent then we've heard is that we would go into executive, executive okay. session after the meeting. So item six on the currently proposed uh, council agenda can come off and move up as a presentation. Yes. And as an executive session. All right. And then we'll have a memorandum of agreement, SPD, and then fire. And a city council appointment and timeline, as we discussed, we'll pick out which option to move forward with. The committee of the whole will have a discussion of council retreat agenda, mayor's report, Commission committee layouts on reports, department of reports, and we'll have a closed executive. It says closed executive session. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just ahead of my time. Uh -huh. We'll have a closed executive session at the tail end of the agenda. <laughs> Any other revisions or notes? Or is that the agenda as we understand it? Yes, I, I do have one. This is Emily Artechi, community development director. I do have one question. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, it was my understanding at the Community Development Committee that um, we could proceed forward directly to the City Council with draft code amendments on the multifamily tax exemption without having to bring back um, a proposal for scheduling. Absolutely. I, I'm not going to say something different than the committee told you. Uh, go ahead, Councilor Mayhew. So I might have misunderstood too, but my thought, my understanding was, uh, so I was surprised to see this here also. Um, yeah, I <laughs> what I thought had happened was a timeline had been decided on and that was just going to happen. And so there's no need to ask the council about the timeline. I did think that that timeline said that once a proposal was ready, it would go back in front of the committee. The, uh, Cor but, correct. Yeah, but that there was no need to ask the council to approve the timeline. That was just resolved. It was going to happen. So I don't think 
there's uh, this item five needs to be here at all. Right. Correct. She's right. So it's the, the well, I haven't seen the agenda bill. I, I should have done my homework, but the agenda bill is the schedule. It's not the That's actual improvement of the exemption has already been approved. No, no, no. They're going to come with an exemption. They're going to put that together. It'll go to the committee. They'll come to the council. The, all this was was looking at possible timelines that got resolved at the meeting. So the timeline's set. They're moving forward. Oh, yeah. Uh, all right. In that case, yeah. I mean, there's no decision to be made. There's no decision. Uh, when you're ready to move forward with the tax exemption with the schedule as agreed upon at committee, bring it forward. Great. Thank you. So number number five can come out. Got it. Thank you. Between CD, applying patients, and right. CD. With that, I believe we have covered. I do have, I, uh, Mayor, I have two subjects afterwards I'd like to catch with you. All right. um, but I believe we've covered the agenda for FNA. Are there other items for discussion for the committee before we adjourn? The starting time? Uh huh? The starting time? Oh, uh, Based on uh, feedback prior and my own wishes and desires, um, I would like to motion uh, during next council to move F and A to start at six o'clock. And if we start to get crammed on time in public works, we can either move it forward or shift F and A back at that time. But right now, we're managing to stay within that one hour period at Parks and Public Works. Haven't we in the past just left that? as a decision for Mayor Pro Tem and Mayor to work out, or has the council voted on that in the past? I, I think that's just for you and the mayor just, to work out, isn't it? I'm just hungry. I, if you guys are, I just want to make sure everybody's okay. If we're okay, we'll do it. <laughs> I think that's how we've always done it. I think there's been a, a regular start time established, although not by ordinance, but by vote of the committee or, you know, through some mechanism so that there is a regular time and that it doesn't, move unless a special meeting is set um, right but his, his right, point is i don't have to take it to council the committee can just decide or the mayor pro tem can just decide this meeting starts then yeah i don't think we let the committee decide i think we let the mayor pro tem decide in conjunction with the mayor i think that's how we've always done well it. i will inform the council next monday that f and a will start start it will begin at six o'clock from now on yep sounds and good just so everybody's aware and if we can make those uh, post council or I guess right now, based on Jim's input, let's make the changes as appropriate on the calendar and move that forward. Okay. Any other items for discussion? If not, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.